Hello, Leapers and fellow travelers. Uh, Sam here, your host of Fate's Wide Wheel. I wanted to drop a quick note up front before we got to the interview with Matt Dale. Uh, as most of you have probably already seen on our social media channels, Dennis is indeed departing the podcast. I am sad about it. Um, I know some of you are sad about it. And the door is certainly always open for him anytime he is able to return. Um, I understand why, and I understand that it's best for him. And I certainly bear him no ill will whatsoever. Um, it's been a difficult process, difficult to process. Um, and I'll leave, I'll leave that part at that, but Dennis is great. Dennis is fantastic. He's going to make space for his own endeavors. So I encourage you to follow him and uh, keep in tune with what he's doing, because I'm sure there will be some wonderful stuff coming your way. Uh, he's still going to be a contributor to this fandom and, and other fandoms. So um, again, I think that uh, you should definitely keep an eye on what he's doing uh, or an ear as the case may be, because it's going to be fantastic. Support him in any way that you can. Um, and certainly for anyone who's ever been a guest on this show, um, or has anything to do with any of the shows that we talk about, support him as well, be a part of whatever he's doing. Um, he certainly deserves it. And, uh, I appreciate all of his support and encouragement through the years. Uh, as longtime listeners will know, this was Dennis's idea. Dennis got me a copy of Matt Dale's first volume, uh, first edition rather, of uh, Beyond the Mirror Image as a wedding gift, told me not to read it until after the honeymoon or not to open the package that it was in until after the honeymoon. Wisely, I followed his advice and um, pretty much as soon as I thanked him for it, he responded with a message saying, so do you want to start a podcast? And I'd already been thinking about doing a podcast. I had wanted to do something that could just cover the stuff that I enjoy talking about. And, 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 uh, when he wanted to do fates wide wheel, do this focused quantum leap podcast, I was all in, I thought it was a great idea and fates wide wheel. That was something that, that I contributed. You know, I, um, when we were brainstorming titles, there were a lot of titles. In fact, some of the titles that we brainstormed have since become titles of other quantum leap podcasts out there. Uh, so clearly we were all kind of on the same wavelength, but for me, fates wide wheel always represented something that, that could go beyond just quantum leap when, the time was right because obviously at the time we started we had a finite amount of episodes to discuss a finite amount of stuff to talk about and i knew when the time came to move on to other things if we named ourselves something that was so closely related with quantum leap we would not necessarily have the opportunity to um to do that without maybe changing the podcast name or at least that was my thought and i thought fate's wide wheel was something that could really while being something hyper specific and very niche to quantum leap it would also kind of encompass a little bit more than that um which excited me so uh that's what we did and you know we agreed on the title and 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 took off and it's been the two of us ever since um you know we've we've certainly had kind of our ups and downs but very minor you know and very few um but uh you know for the most part it's been pretty even keel around here and ups and successes and a lot of fun um but I guess that this is indeed the way things go sometimes. I am committed to continuing Fate's Wide Wheel, to continuing things on a more regular basis as we lead up to the release of Season 2 of Quantum Leap on October the 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central on NBC, streaming the following day on Peacock. Um, we're going to be talking about it here. I, I still say we because it, it's hard to feel like this is anything other than a group effort in some way. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, that book that started it all is getting a second edition and um, the, you know, second volume of which is already actually out. Um, you can find that over on lulu.com or go to Matt Dale's website, forevertv.co.uk for all the information on all of Matt's projects. Um, the second volume, of course, covers the first season of the Revival series. The first volume, which covers the uh, original series, the classic series, is coming out to Kickstarter supporters very soon. Um, likely people will be getting those books within the next four to six weeks. Um, 
maybe a little bit longer depending on where you are, but I am so excited and I am thrilled to be able to bring you this interview with Matt Dale. We talk about a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that's not strictly Quantum Leap related. In fact, one of the things we talk a lot about is Babylon 5, uh, which I'm super excited to to discuss with him. Um, and we obviously cover uh, a lot of the book, the wins, the, the, the where's, the logistics of all of that, um, and some other things. We sort of tease some things maybe for the future because I'd love to have Matt on um, you know, whenever his schedule allows, obviously you can check him out on a regular basis over at the quantum leap podcast. Um, and yeah, you should definitely be putting them in your ears just as you're putting uh, us in your ears, because uh, again, we talk about it on this podcast. I think that, you know, we've really become the go-to source for information when it comes to quantum leap, both of us, you know, it's, it's not a competition. It's, it's, it's this mutually beneficial thing and it helps everybody out. Hopefully in the fandom is richer for it. Um, Cause we're just fans talking about something that we love. So uh, with all of that said, Let's dive in to the interview with Matt. I'm not going to come back at the end. I am I'm just getting that all out of the way. Um, apologies for, uh, uh, you, you know, dropping something in that's kind of a bummer early on, but you're in for some great stuff coming up. And again, you're in for some great stuff coming from Dennis and some great stuff still to come from Fate's Wide Wheel. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, of course, to all of our supporters. We could not do this without you, uh, whether that means you are just clicking that download button, uh, liking, subscribing, uh, whether that is on Apple Podcasts or YouTube or wherever you happen to get your podcasts these days. Uh, I thank you for that. I thank you for all the interactivity. I thank you for the comments. I thank you for the questions. Um, certainly, you know, find us on the social medias. It's just Fate's Wide Wheel wherever uh, you do your social media in that's a word. Um, and of course, if you want to support with a monetary donation to the podcast, I cannot believe that. And I thank you so much for doing that. Make sure you're looking around your community. You're seeing if there are ways that you can help, if there are some wrongs that you can help set right, much like our heroes would do, um, or the world at large. You know, obviously I will always plug my favorite uh, uh, charities. If there's such a thing as a favorite charity, uh, charitable organization, the Trevor Project and Doctors Without Borders. Um, um, if after all of that, you still have some change rattling around and you want to throw it to Fate's Wide Wheel, by all means, visit the Patreon over at Fate's Wide Wheel on Patreon. Uh, the link will be below or in the show notes. Um, and uh, I thank everyone who, who has done that uh, or continues to do that. And that includes Al's Play Sleep Fan Site, Bourbon and Board Games, Carolyn Cosplay Dad, Joanne Bartlett, Dan Tobias, Rich Bork, Kevin, Carol Davis, Dan Tuig, Dex Lower, Dermot Devlin, Barry Donovan, Brian Dreadful, Troy Evers, Larry Ganny, Jason Geis, Kelly M, Michelle Hoffman, Amy Holt, Camp, Lori Johnson, Bess A. Corey, Lady Eternal, Rob Nunn, oddly specific with Audra, Christopher Redman, Adrian Sal, Karen Saxon, Jerry Seward, Mike Stouffer, Heather Strabiak, Damon Sugamelli, Larry Trujillo, Stuart Williams, Jill Wilson, and all of our anonymous patrons. Thank you all so much for helping to keep the lights on. Um, and there will be a lot of new content coming this fall. And hopefully as we start to see the strikes resolve, um, We'll get more of that. Uh, check out, uh, I posted it on our Twitter account, um, but you can just Google it. Check out what Adam Driver had to say actually about the strikes and about smaller studios stepping up and agreeing to the terms um, with SAG-AFTRA. It's pretty incredible and it's spot on and he's able to hit it from a couple of different angles, quite frankly, in under a minute. Um, but he's absolutely right. And we're seeing uh, so many of these smaller studios step up like A24, um, you know, just being one of them. And, 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 it, and it's pretty incredible. And if they can do that, then why can't Amazon, right? Why can't Apple? Why can't these these larger conglomerates and companies? So the gauntlet has certainly been thrown and the actors are out there now being able to publicize and promote these films and projects that they've worked on for these small companies. AMC, for instance, uh, the television uh, station has uh, uh, recently come to an agreement as well. So shows like um, the Walking Dead spinoffs and Interview with the Vampire are going to continue production now um, because... They, they can because they've struck these deals. And if these small companies and, and, and these singular entities can do that, why can't some of these bigger companies? So anyway, um, support sag after support uh, the WGA however uh, you can. And uh, enjoy, enjoy hearing Matt Dale and I talk about a myriad of subjects as well as tease some things, hopefully, for the future. Uh, thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Stay safe out there. And remember, always leap responsibly. Let's kick it over to Matt. Hello, fellow travelers and leapers. Welcome to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm your host, Sam, and I am joined this week by none other than Matt Dale. Matt, how are you? Hey, I'm good, thanks. Good to be back. How are you doing? 
I'm great. It's great to have you back. Uh, I feel like uh, for a while there, we, we talked a lot, you know, via direct messaging and, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, we hadn't had you on in a while. And then last fall, you were on. And now this is what, uh, number three in the span of a year. So I'm grateful uh, that, that we can be in contact a little more often in this medium. Oh, as long as no one gets bored of my voice. That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope not. Oh, um, him again? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, considering how much crossover there has to be between Fate's Wide Wheel and the Quantum Leap podcast, right. I, I would assume that people are certainly not sick of you. Um, <laughs> speaking of the podcast, how are things over at QLP? Yeah, yeah, they're doing good. Thanks. We're, um, yeah, we, we got a, a little a, a little quantum leaped out after the, uh, the first <laughs> season ended. So we, we sure. took a little bit of a break. But yeah, we've, we've been back doing uh, reviews of the early episodes. Um, well, we're into season two now, so not, not even that early. Um, and we're, we're still tracking the novels and uh, our, our bonus shows. So yeah, it's, it's tremendously fun. And then we're just ramping up, I guess, now for... It's only a few weeks or so until season two, so yeah, we're we're getting two thirds of us are getting excited about that. I mean, I don't, I, <laughs> I think anyone that follows is not going to be surprised to know that uh, Alison will be dropping out for eight weeks and then returning. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's it, yeah, so, same old story for us. Um, loads of fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're we're about a third of the way through season two at the moment, and the the whole. The whole point of us going back to the beginning is we were covering the episodes that Albie and Heather covered before um, myself, Chris and Alison took over. And yeah. uh, the rate we're going, maybe another seven, eight months, we might be up to the point now where we started. So I don't know what happens <laughs> then. We need to start right. thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when we were doing the revisited uh, episodes before season one of the revival started, mm -hmm. um, you know, the plan was to just do these short episodes for for as long as we could. And now, the truth be told, I don't know exactly what shape that's going to take going forward. But um, I would love to, to, to at least continue it because I, I felt like it was just an interesting way for us to do something short, brief, and, and give some comments, yeah. uh, you know, especially with newer viewers coming in mm -hmm. with the accessibility of the show on Peacock and the revival starting. Yeah. It just felt like it made sense to kind of do so. Um, but it's, 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 I think it's a great idea to go back and do those episodes with your current team I, you know i think that it, it does give you guys kind of this complete picture of the show uh even just separate from the podcast specifically but just yeah. for the hosts yeah and i mean when you guys um, went back to so the start when you guys went back to the start you you had like a, a whole that whole new format of doing the, the the mini episodes so yeah what you're doing is very different whereas what we're doing is yeah we're, we're following in the exact same format that we followed from runaway onwards we're now doing yeah. genesis up to just before runaway so yeah yeah um, it well it's I, like i said i think it's great it's great to be able to have that kind of archive for for the listeners to be mm -hmm. able to to you know track kind of that through line with with the hosts mm -hmm. um do you feel like, especially because you mentioned like you know, what will happen when you get up to Runaway, do you feel like that the dialogue, uh, you know, chemistry that you share and your thoughts and opinions on the show have evolved in any way that make you want to keep going past Runaway? Do you kind of look back and say like, <laughs> you know, I want to do this. I, I want another. I want another shot at that episode. Ah, <laughs> uh, I I don't know. I think, I mean, Chris had been podcasting for ages. Allison is obviously. A, a professional YouTuber. Uh, I think personally, right. I, I have generally improved in, in my skill. I, I've still got a lot to learn. I'm, I'm still the, the, the third member of the gang. I would like another, another pass at them just for that reason. I don't, I don't sure. know if my thoughts on the episodes will be any different. I just might, uh, maybe I'll be a bit more comfortable on mic. Those, those early episodes, I've not gone back and listened to them, but I know how uncomfortable I was on mic. I know I was I was dragging myself there, kicking and screaming, going, this is a good opportunity. I'm going to force myself to do it, but I'm hating every second of this. And bless them, Chris <laughs> and Allison were so, so welcoming. You know, I, I, I always find it's never quite as bad as we think it is, but I, yeah. I understand exactly what you mean. Um, you know, certainly given the opportunity there a few times when... I, I, I thought even 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 our last episode uh, when we had you on there, 
afterwards I thought I that's just that's not me that's not what I usually do <laughs> I felt so off and just rusty for some reason so uh it, you know it, it happens regardless I think of your experience level um so uh, let's let's go straight to beyond the mirror image uh what kind of update can you give listeners on the book well um <laughs> How long is this going to take to edit before it goes out? Let's let's talk about because this is going to be up to the minute stuff. So very true. I plan on having this out uh, by September first. So I have okay, another episode yeah. currently in the can that I'll drop, and then we'll get to this one. Okay. So I'll tell you what's happening this weekend then, which is uh, is the the twenty sixth at the moment. So just a few days ago, for your listeners, um, I have a hard copy proof. I have a hard copy oh, proof that's here, beautiful. and it's, I'm I'm so I just keep flicking through it, and I'm the weird thing is I'm I'm a big fan of ebooks. I I have very few physical books sure. on my shelf, um, yep. and yet when it's mine, I'm, I keep looking at it going, that, 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 "This is this is crazy." Um, so yeah, yeah, so I have I have my hard copy. Um, this is actually my second proof. My first proof uh, that there were some graphical issues in it, which. I, I couldn't just fix and then trust that they'd be okay. I needed to get mm. a second one done. So I've now got a proof that I'm happy with. Uh, I found a few final errors in it, which I have I fixed 15 minutes before we started recording. I, <laughs> I finally created a file called Volume 1 Print Final. And I'm not a person that puts final in a file name easily because I know you end up yeah. doing final, actual final, final mark two. When I say final, it's yep. final. So straight <laughs> straight after this recording, um, I'm going to be uploading it for the printers and uh, giving them the okay to start printing. So what should be happening for the backers next, uh, the, the couple of hundred people that pre-ordered, is I'll get my palette full of uh, copies in yeah, about a week and a half, two weeks. So a few days after this this goes to air. And then I start shipping them out. Once they're shipped out, I'll then be putting it on Lulu and launching it as a um, as a as a print on demand. So it's it's nearly there. Um, it's just so just fantastic! Quickly. Yeah, so so close, and I can't wait. Um, I, I I was saying to someone uh, earlier tonight. I, I I don't know what it is, but I'm more excited about this than I was in 2016 when I sent. The first edition off to print. I, I think because this <laughs> one's been so much of a team effort, uh, I, I'm feeling the vibe a lot more. When in 2016, mm. when I sent it off to print, I was just one guy thinking, I don't know who's going to buy this, but I'll send, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send it off and I guess it's okay. And the fact that I'm still here seven years later it, is, a, is a constant shock. But here I am. And yeah. I know there's excitement around it and I know people are going to read it and I'm, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the update. Vol volume one about to go to print and then available on print on demand. And the moment it goes on to print on demand, I'll also be starting the Kickstarter campaign for volume three. Yeah. Which I, so I, I, for I assume. You... I, oh, I, go ahead. I, and I, I should mention, I assume most people probably know the reason I'm skipping straight from volume one to three is because two is already out. Um, I, I released volume two earlier this summer because that's the one about the current series. And I want to keep reissuing that every summer with an update in. So that that was kind of a, a very fast release. Still as well researched as the other ones, but uh, the, the timing meant I couldn't do these neatly in order. Uh, two, two was ready when it was ready and it just had to go. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I have a question I want to get back to, but before I do, I, I think one of the wonderful things about volume two um, is that it, it kind of confirms some things that have, have been said recently, you know, and JJ Lindell actually said it on the show when he was on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and we've kind of, I, I think, even individually sort of intimated it without trying to come off as egotistical or too proud. But the fact is that you know, we had this Blu-ray release and DVD release of season one of Quantum Leap. Um, and it is completely bare bones, but I think that, you know, fans of the show are in luck because they have your book, which they can 
order mm-hmm. right now. You know, they can go to lulu.com, like you said, and they can order a, a copy of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's fantastic. And I think people should. And it dovetails so nicely with not just the Quantum Leap project, but quite frankly, with Fate's Wide Wheel as well, yeah. because you pulled stuff from both shows. Um, and really, I think that all of those behind the scenes esque features that you could ever want uh, are available. They just happen to be available unofficially from our podcasts in your book. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've seen people say that online. So I, um, I'm not, I'm not usually a, a boastful, prideful person, but uh, I think there's, <laughs> there's, in, there's enough people saying exactly those words about QLP, about Fate's Wide Wheel. Um, yeah. We, we've been filling in those blanks for the last year the book is is a part of that and yeah i i wouldn't if i was working in isolation and if there was no qlp and if there was no fates wide wheel the the book just wouldn't have happened there there would be so little yeah. of interest to say so much of it is curated from those sources uh, not to say that if you've listened to all the podcasts, you shouldn't buy the book, because there's obviously right. so so many hours of the podcast, no one can keep it in their head. So the book is a nice summary of all the the key the key facts and and figures from from the last year. And I think yeah, it's, it's a I, celebration as well. That's how I I think of it. It's a, a celebration of the fact that we've managed to we've come through thirty years of failed attempts, and then here's these eighteen episodes, and and here's something. Yeah, commemorating it, celebrating it. Yeah, you know, it's funny when I did my little capsule review of it um, a few weeks back, that was one of the things that uh, I, mm-hmm. I think I mentioned first is that I loved the fact that it wasn't just diving directly into the revival, that you did take a moment to kind of take stock of the past 30 years and the attempts that have been made and, and just where you know everything was at by the time you know we got to last fall. And, and I thought that that was a really smart thing to do because it, it easily could have been the type of thing that ended up either at the end of volume one or somewhere in volume three, but putting yeah. it at the beginning of volume two i mean obviously it makes a lot of sense but i, I just thought it was a, a, a nice way to like you said celebrate w- how far the we yeah. as a fandom and the show itself has come i mean sam we're both doctor who fans i i'm assuming <laughs> that you you find 1990 to 2004 as fascinating as i do because i love all that stuff oh yeah it's just what, what yep. an amazing era of Let's try this webcast and see if it works. Let's try co-production with America and see if it works. This, that, and the other. And we in Quantum Leap fandom had our own. Um, it just lasted a lot longer. Uh... Yes, yes, it did. I was. It's funny you mentioned that because I was reading, somebody posted a meme the other day talking about the fact that we are now at a point where we have reached just as much time between the Ninth Doctor's era starting and today as there was between survival and Rose. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that that makes sense, but I can't compute that in my head. Uh, right. The, the, new, yeah, the new series is, is still so new, and I, I'm, I was getting into Doctor Who fandom early 90s, I would say, so mm-hmm. so much of my formative years as a fan, uh, Doctor Who was never coming back. It was, it was right. old news, and it was done. And... Uh, Arguably the same with Quantum Leap as well. I didn't, oh, yeah. although I, I watched it while it was on, I didn't really become a fan fan until maybe seven, eight years ago. Well, there was no mm. chance this is coming back. Ancient history. So looping back to the, the volume two bit, that, that was why I was really excited to write about that whole period of time because yeah. I know how I, I just felt this isn't coming back and that's fine. It was a good show when it was on, but now there's just this this period of history that's yeah stuff happened but not the stuff that we right. wanted and and how surprising that was at, at the end of that 30 years that look here it is again ben song yeah it, it it's incredible and i think it is a testament to a lot of of fans ability to persevere and have patience mm-hmm. and exactly. you know continue to, to have that interest as well, because I'm on the record on the podcast as saying numerous times that I was fine without it ever coming back. Because mm-hmm. again, as you document in volume two, there were murmurings, you know, pretty much from shortly after the show went off the air all the way up until, you know, maybe a few years before things mm-hmm. really got serious uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it's funny to think about a couple of years ago, hearing about those murmurings and even seeing Deborah Pratt, like post a little something about it. 
and you're thinking to yourself, well, we've, we've been here before, you yeah. know, and then flash forward about six months and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, this is happening. Yeah. Um, but it's, but, but yeah, to, to, to have seen that and to, ha you know, it's interesting because my perspective on the show, uh, I, I watched the show as it originally aired, but I was very young. I was thinking about this the other day. I watched the first episode. I believe I was only seven years old, but I, mm -hmm. but I have very distinct memories of, of watching, you know, the premiere and, 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 and then when it went off the air, I was, you know, I had not. I think I had not turned 13 yet um, or no, wow. I had not turned 12, excuse me. And um, it was right before I turned 12. And then uh, it, even though obviously I could call myself a fan and I had watched the show from those ages, you know, how, how much of it are you really, you know, taking with you, right? How much of yeah. it were you really absorbing? And so um, it wasn't until I was in high school. It wasn't until kind of the, you know, late nineties in particular when, you know, it was clear that like this show was important to me beyond being something I watched when I was a kid. And uh, I, that just never went away. You know, it never went mm -hmm. away. And it was something that was always kind of in my consciousness that I was always aware of. And I, you know, anytime I moved or unpacked or whatever, those books, you know, went up right with the Doctor Who books or whatever. Uh, and so it's, it's, I, I just think that, yeah, that, that journey is is so fascinating to think about. And especially mm -hmm. considering some of those attempts that almost happened, um, which again, you know, you cover, you cover in, in the book. Um, can you talk just a little bit about some of those attempts that almost happened? Yeah. So, well, I mean, one of the, the ones that I found most interesting, um, especially since I was, I was able to get hold of a script for it was uh, Trey Calloway's Bold Leap Forward. And Trey Calloway, mm -hmm. I think is a, uh, certainly at the time was best known for one of the I Know What You Did Last Summer films. Um, I, I, I'm not <laughs> sure if he's known for anything else since, but um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting script because it's, it definitely takes some of the, the fundamentals of Quantum Leap, but tries desperately to update it and bring it to the 21st century. But it's so soon after at the time it seemed like it, it had been years well, it had been years but looking back now great scheme of things big picture it was only eight nine ten years after it was too soon to be doing such a radical modernization and yeah. really interesting idea but um yeah not not at the right time and that that was one of the first ones to really kick off this obsession with getting sammy joe into uh, into the picture as a as a major player, which personally, I'll be shot down for this, but I've never understood. I've never understood the desperation <laughs> to get Sammy. I mean, I I'd have no issue if she turned up in the new series, but I don't understand. Uh, and and I know Deborah is is one of the key voices that says this. I don't understand this. Sure. Uh, if if the show's going to come back, it has to have Sammy Joe. Does it though? Does it have right. to? I don't know. Um, so there was that, and then. Shortly after that, that was when Deborah really started picking up her time child concept, which was all focused around Sammy Joe, and she had that the movie that she had the backing of, uh, the the novelization uh, that she she completed five chapters of, which is really interesting stuff. And there's a there's a synopsis of those five chapters in the book. Um, yeah, it's it's balmy in in the best possible <laughs> way. It's. Um, <laughs> Particularly because the entire first chapter uh, is a dream sequence, uh, which in retrospect is so frustrating when you've only got five chapters of this potentially massive story that she had planned. One right. fifth of it feels wasted, in inverted commas, on a flipping dream sequence. I'm just like, come on, yeah. come on with it. Uh, but it's the dream sequence is amazing and it's beautifully written. Um, so that's that's really interesting to get into. And then... After that, it all it all seems to just go into this whole, uh, and I mentioned this a couple of times. This this whole point of every time Scott Bakula gets interviewed, someone says to him, "So when's Quantum Leap coming back?" And right. uh, and he says, "Oh, wouldn't that be great if it came back?" And then the internet goes on fire because everyone thinks Scott Bakula has got an insight that it, actually he didn't. He's just being kind. Right. And that keeps going on for years, <laughs> and then we start having spoofs like the, the the Donald Trump sketch and uh, <laughs> Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which me, because I'm very weird like this, I, I try and crowbar into canon. Um, so 
they're, they're not really attempted. Well, they're not attempted revivals at all by any sane person's standards. But I give them suitable coverage in the book because there are other people like they're out me that are that are strange enough to try and consider those to be canon. And to those that aren't, I say to you, just skip those three or four pages in the book. Your life will still be happy without it. But <laughs> yes. um, I always refer back at this point to the um, this this. A chronology of Back to the Future, uh, written by a guy called Rich Handley, where where effectively he and a, a friend tried to do the same thing and just got everything Back to the Future related and smushed it into a canon, including cartoons on the side of Happy Meal boxes and stuff like that. Just just uh, tried to fit in. Uh, so I figure if they can do that, I can absolutely include the Donald Trump sketch from the Tonight Show. Why not? That's it's why canon. not? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as as uh, is as is um, uh, the sunny in Philadelphia episode definitely definitely kind of right. Well, you know, the thing that always fascinates me, especially when time travel is involved, and of course this takes us back to Doctor Who for a moment, is that when people try to argue against something being canon or 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 i don't you know i these days i'm almost shy to use that word like i'd rather yeah. just be like it matters it counts to me you know like whatever yes it doesn't have to count for everybody but it counts for me um and there was a discussion recently on reddit about lung Barrow, which is the the final novel of the new adventures mm -hmm. for listeners that, that might not be aware and the new adventures were the books that were put out during those wilderness years that matt mentioned earlier and it was a very big monumental novel with lots of stuff about the doctor's past and it's and mad. you know it was oh yeah yeah just completely out there stuff but also felt like this wonderful culmination of everything that had come before with that particular <laughs> range of books and um and I, with while also kind of pointing slyly towards the future in, in in a way even though there was this awareness at the time that virgin which were the publishers of that range were no longer going to have it that, that the bbc <laughs> was going to take it in house so anyway with all that said Somebody was asking if they should pay a premium price for a physical copy because it's it's mm -hmm. it's become quite a collector's item. Yeah. And uh, you know, I responded with a comment about like, you know, I, I I don't know that I would pay that if I was only buying that book. Like to me, I would want you know if I, I if I had all of the books and I was missing that one, then yeah, I would probably pay that price mm -hmm. for it. Um, and then I went on to make a couple of comments about how it was an important book and how, you know, did some interesting things with the character and yada, yada, without spoiling anything. And somebody came back and, and, and I should have seen this coming a mile away. I, and I can already was like, see yeah, where but you're it's not go. canon. Oh. Right, right. It's like, <laughs> and I was just sort of like, I didn't respond at all. I just was like, I said what I needed to say. But in my mind, all yeah. I thought is we're talking about a character who travels in time, you know, in a box, yeah. like there's no reason why it can't all count, why it can't all be yeah. part of it. And that's how yeah. I feel. Like for me, it's all, yeah. it's all a part of the story. Like whether yeah. it's televised, whether it's, you know, stuff that happens in the novelizations that we don't see on screen, whether it's the new adventures, the eight doctor adventures, the, the big finish audios, it all counts as far as yeah. I'm concerned. And when it comes to quantum leap, I feel similarly because there's, I mean, within the novels themselves, there are times when things will literally change back at the project mm -hmm. because time is kind of in flux so i i'm with you i feel like there's no reason why it, it's always sunny and and the sketch uh yeah. the late show can't count <laughs> that there's precious little quantum leap still despite the fact that it's it's been revived there is still very right. little quantum leap why would you spend time discounting it and i did i internally cringed a few minutes ago when i heard myself using the word canon because that used to be quite a safe word it it i know these days quite often gets used as a form of gatekeeping and yes yeah to, to me if if you choose that something i i think your your wording's much better does it count I, if 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 you choose that something counts it counts if you choose that it doesn't count it doesn't count and if you want to decide that um one strobe over the line doesn't count eh, good for you i'm not going to try and argue <laughs> it I, I mean I, I don't know why you would but why not but it's yeah pe people seem to just make this decision that the novels don't count and right because i'm saying they're not canon Therefore, they shouldn't count for right. you. Well, no, the, everyone can have their own internal canon, and yes. my ca my canon is very broad. And um, yeah, I it, as I understand it, the only the only major franchise that has really an official canon where the the bods on top try to express that is Star Wars, and even with Star Wars, I ignore it. I don't care if, if right. Disney or Lucasfilm or whatever say 
the Droids and Ewoks cartoon series is not canon anymore. It is to me. Don't care. That, right? I mean, who, who, it, it's got the logo on it. It's it, you can fit it into the history. So why not? I yes. I'm I, I'm still going to enjoy it, whether or not someone uses the c word. It's absolutely, I, and that's the way I feel about you know all of that media that you know when Disney mm. took over, they kind of decanonized in the Legends range and stuff. And yeah. I get like from from their point of view, they sort of needed to do that in order to tell these new stories with the sequel trilogy. But I, I, the amount of furor that that created and still seems to create, you, you know, yeah. amongst the fandom is unfortunate because for me, I look at it as like, Hey, we got three new movies. Well, five new movies really, but we got three new movies that continued this story that might not necessarily fit with this range of novels that we've mm -hmm. been reading for, you know, 25 yeah. years or whatever, but that doesn't mean you can't go and read and enjoy those books. Like, yeah. They're still there. They still exist. Yeah. And that, that's <laughs> um, that's the danger of the word canon. I, I yeah, I see people right. say don't don't bother reading the quantum leap novels because they're just fan fiction. Well, no, that they're not. They were they were professional <laughs> and they were paid for, and they've got a logo on them, and it, yeah, and Universal approved them. So, right, yeah, sorry guys, they're official. You don't want to read them. Fine, that's your choice, but don't tell other people not to because they're like I say, it, it gets used as a gatekeeping word, and so it it annoys me. Um, yeah, and especially. As, as you quite rightly said, in a, a show about time travel, it's very easy. Star Wars, yes, actually, that's, that's a challenging example because when they start going in a different direction, it's a bit harder to try and retcon stuff. With a show about time right. travel, it's so easy to retcon things. Um, so, yeah, so, so I do and I have. Right. <laughs> and why shouldn't you? Um, exactly. You know, speaking of time travel, I, I I want us to obviously get back to the books, but it just feels like this is the perfect opportunity to introduce something completely different from what we've already been talking about. Uh, and that is Babylon 5, The Road Home, which I think is another kind of interesting, you know, piece of what we are, what we've just been talking mm -hmm. about, obviously with, with like canon and gatekeeping, et cetera, um, while also talking about time travel um, and revivals, because right, exactly. really the road home and the conversation <laughs> surrounding it really checks all of those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so before we, before we address it directly, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into Babylon 5 and just, you know, what your overall thoughts on the show are? Oh man, I I love Babylon Five. Uh, so, yeah, I I got into it first when it it first aired on Channel Four uh, in the UK in the in the nineties. Um, several months after season one started in the US, and then because you guys have your gap weeks and we don't, we ended up yep. catching up and getting ahead of you at the end uh, each yeah. season. So so pretty much in parallel, <laughs> if you were watching it the first first uh, time around as well, I probably got into it around about the same time as you did. Uh, except we skipped the pilot, so we didn't. Mm. I didn't become a fan until Midnight on the Firing Line, and I was a fan from day one. So yeah. um, at, at that point in my life, I was uh, mid nineties, uh, early teens. My pocket money was all going on blank VHS tapes that I could record sci-fi TV shows off the TV. Um, and on commercial channels like Channel 4, sitting there with the pause button ready to cut out the adverts live so I could get uh, these perfect archives that would never be better. Yes. He says, right, with right. the, the Blu-rays on the verge of coming out. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> I, I, I had off-airs of uh, all the Star Trek shows that, that were there at the time, uh, Space Above and Beyond, X-Files, <laughs> um, Dark Skies, Alien Nation, all, all, that, all that kind of era stuff yeah um, so i was i knew i was i wanted to like babylon 5 and i loved the fact that it was going to present a story arc um being primarily a sci-fi fan at the time the concept of a a story arc was just bewildering to me and i i know right. other other genres have done it beforehand jms takes a lot of credit for doing the first big story arcs on tv maybe <laughs> not but but the first big story arcs in sci-fi tv yeah, I mean, the exception of things like Blake Seven, Blake Seven, which right. which was shorter seasons. Um, yeah, he he did amazingly. So yeah, I B five has been one of my favourite TV shows ever, uh, right from the start. Despite season one being shaky, I, I was watching it 
fully yeah. aware of some of the shakiness and forgiving every moment of it because I loved so much of it. And uh, it's 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 followed me that that passion that you were talking about uh, with Quantum Leap, which never I I never had that until very recently. Sorry, I've had, a, I've had an yeah. interloper. I've had an interloper yeah, in the room, and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, that you can tell I was slightly distracted. She was kind of hiding from her mother, and when when she was found, she decided to let out a yelp of joy. So, uh, but, but she is now she is now uh, uh, escaped the studio and is headed back upstairs. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know. One of the things that's interesting about my journey with Babylon 5 is that you would think, especially because much like you, I was into all of that and I was watching most. I, it, it's funny, Alien Nation, when it started here, I was I was young again. It That was like, what, 89, I want to say. Yeah. So it felt a little bit over my head at times, uh, not even necessarily over my head. That might be the wrong way to put it, but it just was, it was targeted, I think at a, at a slightly different audience than where mm -hmm. I was, whereas quantum leap could still, I feel like connect with me, um, at that young yeah. age. So, uh, I was aware of it. I'd seen a few episodes, but I didn't necessarily get into it until later on when I caught it in reruns. Um, but I was I was into Star Trek. I'd seen Star Trek Next Generation, uh, mostly with my grandfather. Um, so I had this awareness of Star Trek. I'd seen most of the Star Trek movies up until that point, um, like the first five films, uh, especially two, three, four and five. Five is not a great movie, I know. But for some reason, it's the one I had on VHS. So it's the one I've seen the most. That's a whole nother story. Uh, <laughs> I, I I have I, a real fondness for five, so maybe we can talk about that sometime. Yeah, but yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, um, I yeah, it, it, it's special to me. Um, mm. And I, I had an awareness of Doctor Who. I'd seen a few episodes. I don't think I'd ever seen a full story um, up to this point. But anyway, uh, I got heavily into Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. And that was one I watched as soon as it started airing, which of mm -hmm. course started airing kind of parallel to Babylon Five. Now, mm -hmm. without going too far into it, there's some behind the scenes drama potentially between the shows. You know, JMS had mm -hmm. uh, shown the, the the script in the Bible to Paramount, yeah. pitched the show to Paramount. They passed on it. And then shortly after DS9 is created. And there are certainly some striking similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I was really into DS9. Still am. Love it. It's my favorite track. Um but it was, wasn't until season three, end of season two, beginning of season three, that I got into Babylon 5, which is probably good in a way because it's definitely like the filet of the show. Like season three yeah. and four are just, you know, the, the best uh, um, run of episodes. Um, luckily, I had a dear friend of mine um, who's not listening, but if you are, Brian, hello. Uh, Brian, he uh, had a, a wonderful library of VHS uh, that he had recorded off air episodes of Next Generation and DS9 and of course, Babylon 5. So he loaned me his tapes of Babylon 5 so I could get caught up. Um, wow. And what a great oh, binge. It was, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. And like you said, season one is a little shaky. And I came to find out later that there were a couple of missing episodes here and there. But in season one, it doesn't matter as much as it yeah. does later on. Yeah. So I didn't realize it until sci-fi aired their um, mm -hmm. uh, re-airing. Uh, but I can remember when sci-fi started their re-airing, I was, much like you, bought brand new blank tapes so that I could mm -hmm. record it you know, every night. And I, you know, I, I did that for, for most of the run um, and then fizzled out because I was starting college. But anyway, uh, I love the show. There's so much about the show that uh, I, I just think it, it feels that it goes beyond um, so much of what Star Trek was even capable yeah. of doing certainly at the time. And certainly I would say without a show like Babylon five, you probably never would have seen the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, which I think yeah. takes a lot, you know, from yeah. it. Um, and I don't mean that in like, a, you know, Ron Moore stole this from Babylon five. I mean that maybe Babylon five created an environment that liberated, mm -hmm. you know, Ron Moore and the creators to, to do Battlestar Galactica the way that Definitely. they did. Um, so that kind of brings us to now, which is, uh, I, I guess it was about a year and a half ago or so when JMS announced that they were working on a revival of the show, mm -hmm. uh, but it would not actually be a revival. It would be a reboot that they would go and yeah. tell the story all over again. Uh, he was working with the CW for this. Um, the murmurings 
you know, at the time were that this would be very different, though, that it would not be the Babylon 5 that we had already seen, mm -hmm. but that the, you know, some of the, the broad strokes would be similar. Mm -hmm. enough. I was a little on the fence about this notion because one of the things, and we'll talk about this more in Road Home, is the actors created, along with the writers, obviously, created these characters that are so iconic i think for fans of not only the show but the sci-fi genre and and they stand shoulder to shoulder as far as i'm concerned with a kirk or a spock or a picard yeah. i mean especially when you start talking about like a londo or a jakar or and, and yeah. unfortunately we've lost a lot of those actors mm -hmm. and while i'm certainly not going to sit here and pump my fist and say oh it's disrespectful and how could you there's something to me about you know reimagining that world that gave us so much that feels um it does feel a little reductive oddly enough yeah and i just didn't know if i wanted that um yeah I, I, how did you feel yeah no i i felt exactly the same um i always excited for jms to announce a new b5 related project despite the fact that Absolutely. usually they they turn out to be they attempted pilots that don't go anywhere. He's done that a few times now, but I, I'm yes. still, he's, he's a good writer and they're good characters. So I was interested, but I was, yeah, for sure. Very wary. I knew obviously because of the actors passing away and the fact that so many of them are, are getting to an age now where, yeah, we definitely couldn't reboot the show with the original actors, nor would a 30 years later series be particularly interesting so right. yeah i had very mixed feelings and yeah open-minded i didn't want to be one of those people that said not my babylon 5 if it came back because we've right. seen that in several fandoms but yeah I, I kind of had the feeling that i i might end up doing that and i say that as a i'm a huge fan of the bsg reimagining um, but mm -hmm. then I was never particularly into the original BSG, so I never Same felt here. like anything was being stolen from my childhood. Uh, this, yeah, definitely, and you you summed up the reasons why. Um, it's the, the those characters and the actors are so intertwined. I would have really struggled with a recasting, and the characters were created to tell a certain story. So rebooting it to tell a different story, I. Yeah, I, I I felt and still feel, given what what's happened uh, with this the animated movie, I, I just I don't know if I'm interested in a different story with these characters. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I think that that's the key, right? Is that you hit on it perfectly. The characters were created, I think, in very specific ways, and there were very specific storylines and and things that you know he wanted to explore by way of these characters and. Um, he did a, an incredible job, obviously, uh, of when, you know, Sinclair left the show mm -hmm. of, of being able to, you know, he, he said he said he had trap doors, whether or not that's yeah. true or not, who knows, but he said that he had trap doors for the characters so that if someone left the show or, you know, something like that happened, that there were ways to kind of transfer some of that material onto someone new. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think it worked for the most part, less so in season five with Lockley, and that's no one's fault, but it, you know, it just didn't work yeah. as well with as it would have if Ivanova had been there. But um, you know, the the thing that I've always thought to myself, I would have loved to have seen in some format, whether it was comic books, novelization, or you know, even in this new animated fashion, I would have loved to have seen what the show would have looked like if Sinclair had been there the full five. Yeah. and I don't think yeah. I'm alone in that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I would love for that to have gone the the whole way and actually seen um, the uh, Tamalin Tamita character uh, continuing yes. through again in like a comic book form, whatever. Uh, Talia Winters, or well, actually no, because Talia Winters was brought in to replace Lita and then got replaced. So Lita carried right. on right the way through the whole original grand design. I would love to to see that in some form. Um, yeah, I I think that that would just be really it, it, that to me. Um, I would probably enjoy whether or not mm. I want to see that live action, you know, with a new cast and then new story elements. I don't know. Uh, however, all of that said, um, I don't know that I'm a little murky on the details, to be honest with you, but it sounds like the CW didn't pass completely on the project 
but they decided not to move forward with it at the mm -hmm. time um, while also kind of keeping it in development. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, you, you know, even JMS has kind of said like, Hey, it's still, it's still going. It's not dead, yeah. but it's also not happening. So who knows what will happen with that? However, in the meantime, uh, JMS sly little devil that he is, uh, hinted at something coming and announced uh, a little while back that Battle of Five, The Road Home, uh, an animated movie, mm -hmm. would indeed be hitting um, physical media and streaming media um, for sale just recently. just came out a few weeks ago, actually. And um, there's a lot to love about it. There's some things I'm not too sure about. Mm -hmm. um, but... I thought it was I, what I will say is before I ever saw it, I thought what a lovely way to tell a story in this world that he's already created and explore some stuff with these characters. Um, I didn't know how they were going to do it in particular when it came to um, the actors who, who are no longer with us, because the amazing mm -hmm. thing about this is all of the actors who are still living and participated, you know, in the original series who have characters in the animated movie mm -hmm. are here. Um, which is great to hear those voices again. Um, but I was excited about it. And I was, I, I was genuinely, I was like, this is so cool because the last time we got something even remotely close to this was the lost tales, which is something that's better to not be spoken of as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and as generous oh, and bless. kind as I try to be that, that is, you, yeah. You can tell that was filmed in a garage. Everyone, everyone. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> people, people worked on that though. And they, yes. they did work. So good for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I'm curious as to what your feelings were when, when it was announced and then uh, feel free to jump right into what your thoughts were upon seeing it. Yeah. I, I was so pleased that he'd taken this route of an, an animated movie and I can't remember how, how early on it, it became clear. I think we we knew for definite that um, uh, that the original actor for Sheridan was was going to be involved. Uh, I, I I don't know. I think the rest became clear later on. But you know, like I was saying earlier, okay, we 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 can't do anything with these actors anymore because they're they're too old and too dead. And yeah. here actually is an opportunity. And also, as I said, I didn't want to see something thirty years later. Actually, yeah animation fantastic now we've got an opportunity to do something set during broadly speaking during that timeline so i was so pleased just to see that it was going to be animation because i realized it, it could be it could form part of the standard timeline without it being a reboot um what a what a great opportunity um then the trailer hit and i started to have some doubts because mm. it it became immediately clear from the trailer well, it it appeared from the trailer that it might be effectively fan wank uh, is, is the Doctor <laughs> Who fandom term for it, uh, which is is a term Doctor Who fans use for fan fiction, sometimes published fan fiction uh, that's just there to be fan pleasing. Um, and that, how dare you say yeah. that about divided loyalties? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Sher Sheridan jumping around between time and between time streams to give the opportunity for some cool scenes with no real plot thread between them. I kept an open mind. Yeah. But then I sat down to watch the film and that is exactly what it was for better and for worse. I was grinning like a fool all the way through it because all these individual scenes, it's like, oh, cool, they've got these people back. And oh, cool, it's a really nice idea for a scene. And like, wow, he's finally done something that covers the entire shadow invasion of the B5 station that we've kind of seen hinted at a few times in the, the series. What, yeah. 30 years later, we're actually getting to see that whole battle. Amazing. But <laughs> there is no there is no plot line. It's, it's Sheridan gets hit with a tachyon beam and gets gets thrown through space and time and, and eventually makes his way back using a combination of the next generation episode remember me and the climax of the sheridan's fall on zahadum arc i mean the whole like what what were you thinking of as you fell um didn't we do this in like season four episode three episode four 
Uh, yeah. Plus, plus, yeah. yeah um, Beverly Crusher running around the Enterprise trying to trying to escape something that actually she just needs to leap through because the person she loves is on the other side. Um, yeah, no plot, but I think if you go into it accepting that it's a lightweight seller. It, all right, again, Doctor Who fandom. This feels like the Five Doctors or Dimensions in Time. It, it's an an, it's a it's an anniversary special that yes. is flimsy, but we're all in it for the love of it. And if you don't concentrate too much, so much fun. Um, the the animation itself, I think, is is beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, most of the actor or most of the characters look amazingly like what they what they did originally. Um, I. Um. I don't think much of Marcus Cole or Veer. Uh, both both of them looked, but they're, they're only in for a few seconds each. But they looked right. terrible. Um, the rest of them, I thought, looked really good. And you know, I've been speaking to a number of comic book artists recently about the challenge of replicating actors versus just doing your own thing with mm. a character like Spider Man or whatever. And and, the, and I've come to respect a lot. Actually, yeah. How how do you get you know, somebody you know so clearly, like Michael O'Hare. Everyone knows what Michael O'Hare looks like, and suddenly you've got to draw him using six or seven lines. Um, amazing feat. So, yeah, it, it looks great. Uh, fantastic music. Great scenes. Um, I'm, I'm definitely glad for it to be in my life rather than it to be not. Quite flimsy. But, yeah. then, but then that end, which we... Uh, I, I certainly didn't see coming, where he, he disappears off and we stay in this alternate reality, which is a bit, okay, structurally, right. that's a little bit odd. And then you have that, that line where Ivanova says, uh, yeah, we're here and we're here to stay. Right. Oh, is this a backdoor pilot? Which we, we've all just right. didn't realise. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that that's a bit of an info dump of everything that I've been thinking over the last week or so, but... Uh, yeah. What about you? So I I feel very similar to you. And I, I'm so glad, you know, it's funny because I, I have a very special place in my heart for the five doctors, as I'm sure many, many Doctor Who fans mm -hmm. do, especially people who saw it, you know, as it aired or when they were kids or, or whatnot. But for me, like I, uh, you know, I was watching it on VHS uh, in the 90s and I targeted uh, all of the two packs uh, or more of VHS uh, at the the local media play, which really had the, mm -hmm. the best Doctor Who selection in in my town. And I would go to media play, and I would always just dis I, I decided I'm going to buy whatever gets me the most bang for my buck. Like so, mm -hmm. I'm going to buy all the two packs, and one of those was the Five Doctors and the King's Demons. And uh, I just I, there was something about watching the Five Doctors, um, and I think at that point I had seen stories from all of the previous Doctors. Um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely had because I, I know that like War Games, Green Death, and um, Genesis of the Daleks and the Sontaran Experiment were like, you know, three of my first ones along mm -hmm. with um, the Daleks and Daleks Invasion of Earth. And so I'd seen the first four Doctors in action, and I'd never seen Peter Davison. This was the first time I'd ever seen the Fifth Doctor. Um, right. And there was just a vibe about the way that it starts and the story that it tells that I felt like, oh yeah, I can get into this without having seen him. And then of course going back and now having seen his entire era, I think you get a greater appreciation for maybe where his character is at the beginning of that and at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that very loosely, this isn't like the deep character building that we're used <laughs> to today, but that said, it's, it's interesting enough. However, when you mentioned Dimensions in Time, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what this is. It's like these little <laughs> snippets of stuff that's fairly just cotton candy. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. very much. It's just we're, we're glad to see some of these characters, the guest spots from EastEnders folks, whatever. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah here's this thing. Um, because as it begins, you get the sense that there is going to potentially be this story. In fact, maybe it even ties into this new device that they're building to help, you know, reduce pollutants and yet mm -hmm. give more energy. And it's like, oh, what if there's some sort of interesting message about, you know, new technology or all mm -hmm. this sort of stuff? No, no, none of that. It's literally just, no, Sheridan gets thrown around in time and uh, in space and into different universes um, and he has to get back. But yeah, there's nothing else going on. And... I felt to me like 
I loved when he goes and he's with his dad. I thought that was some really nice sort yeah. of stuff. Um, we get kind of the, I can't help but compare it to this, the sort of Batman moment where, you know, he doesn't fall down into the cave, but he gets lost in the cornfield mm -hmm. and has to find his way out. Um, which of course ties into the ending as well. And I always loved when Rance Howard, Ron Howard's father uh, would guest as Sheridan's dad on the show. He did yeah. that a few times. And, um, I just always thought he brought so much gravitas and, and, and power to these small little appearances. And it, you could tell the effect that it had on the character of Sheridan and, and, and Bruce Boxleitner as an actor. Um, but then when we got to the Icarus expedition on Zaha doom, I was struck by a couple of things. One, Babylon 5 has always treated time travel um, within the course of the, the five seasons proper as something that always was. So if someone traveled through time, the evidence of it always existed. Yes. This is not, this is not Quantum Leap. This is not Back to the Future. This is like, it, you know, going back to the very first season, there are things that happen that don't pay off for like two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then you realize it's like, oh, that ha that's why that happened. To the point that one of the biggest, uh, you know, elements of the story, and I'm not actually going to spoil this because I hope people that haven't seen it will go back and watch it, especially considering there are the Blu-rays coming out in December. But one of the biggest, mo most momentous events and, and episodes in the series uh, literally explains something that happened a thousand years ago. Yeah. And the thing that you realize is it always happened that way. Yeah. So when Sheridan shows up on Zaha Doom, and I'm going to get a little into spoiler territory here, you get the sense that, I mean, the very real sense is like, well, that's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. And if he's in his timeline, we should have seen some sort of evidence of this happening. Now, obviously, he never, you know, JMS never would have known that this was going to happen. The other yeah. thing that bothered me is that Sheridan's connection to that particular expedition is pretty important yep. and strong. Yes. And it is not touched on at all. I, yeah, I was so that, disappointed. I, <laughs> I, I was waiting. I, I mean, there were two things I was waiting for in that that didn't show, didn't show up. The other one is that Morden didn't show up. Yes, all. yeah. Uh, he exactly. should be at least just walking in the background. Right, uh, lo looking awesome, uh, but yeah, why? Why or he, he could have just jump run on up that... to Sheridan? What do you want? <laughs> yes, but why he didn't jump on the communicator and say, "Anna, Anna, is that you? Get, right. get out of there quickly!" I we know he's got over; he's fallen in love with Delenn, but surely right. that he was married to her. That just kicks in. Um, yeah, he, he ma no mention of Anna. Weird. Yeah, very strange. Very very strange. Then when he gets to the Babylon squared timeline where he's on Babylon five and it's clear that this is, as you mentioned earlier, sort of that, especially for fans of Babylon five, this kind of iconic moment mm -hmm. of a seed that's planted early in season one about Babylon five being destroyed by the shadows in the future. And there's just so many great moments there, the interactions between Garibaldi and Sinclair, Ivanova's moment in the uh, CNC. And then, and now Sheridan's there. And again, the way that time travel has been treated in Babylon five, it's like, well, this isn't, this isn't how it happened. And I don't yeah. necessarily have a problem with that, but it yeah. made me wonder why the choice was made to have him so involved mm -hmm. with, you know, defending against the shadows being there, basically interrupting what was an incredibly important moment in the fabric of the series between Garibaldi and Sinclair. Cause we didn't get, the you know this is the moment i've been born for thing which yeah, is so I, important i was waiting for that line yeah right whereas we yeah. do get ivanova's you know line in c and c which mm -hmm. is exactly as verbatim the, the the line yeah um now i i did have a couple of thoughts one thought was it's reinforced that he can not only go through his own timeline but he's in parallel universes yeah so if this is a parallel universe then perhaps it's not actually what we saw in babylon squared <laughs> Perhaps when he's there on Zaha Doom with the Icarus uh, expedition, it's not the actual Icarus expedition that his wife went on. But there's no indication ever given that that's the case. So it just makes me say, well, at some point you have to you have to let me in on the secret a little bit mm -hmm. because otherwise I'm just going to be left here saying, you know, saying like, why, uh, why aren't we getting a little bit more uh, of how time travel has been treated traditionally in this universe? And furthermore, you know, when we're interrupting some of these big moments or things are changing in this, in this really interesting way, um, you know, what impact might that have? 
Yeah. The other thing about that particular moment, and then I want to hear your thoughts, is that when he's on Babylon 5 uh, for the shadow invasion, he goes down to, you know, self-destruct the station uh, in the power core. And out of nowhere, Lita and Jakar show up. And I am like, why are they there? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're there because we, we know they end up getting friendly at the end of season five. It, it's, a, it's, right. a, it's a fan favorite pairing from completely the wrong era of the show. But that, and the other thing as well, you didn't mention, um, Ivanova's in the wrong uniform. So that's the mm. other thing that immediately clued me into, all right, they're not spelling it out, but clearly this is not the same. Or it, it's very, very similar to the stuff we've seen right. with, this is the moment I was born for and all that stuff, but it's, um, it's an excuse to revisit those scenes, but shifting into a parallel universe. But, and, yeah. and, Jakar and Lita, who, who knows why they're there, except that it's cool. But by that point, my brain's going into overload about, well, this is this is a parallel timeline. So frankly, when Jakar and Lita die, I don't care. Yeah. Um, it just, it, it, it removes all peril because you know that they're still alive uh, in, in the real timeline. And right. I, I know they're all just as real as each other. We should care. Right. But that's not that's not how fiction works. If, no. if they're saying he's temporarily shifted across to meet these people that look and sound a lot like our heroes, they're going to die. But then he's going to go back and meet the real ones. It, I can't I can't make that connection. So again, cool to see. Um, but the, the other thing, the thing I thought you were going to mention when you said he he goes down, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's this like sarcastic computer. What? Oh. What? <laughs> was there something in in? I mean, I've watched Babylon 5 a lot of times, and I did not get where that came from. Was that an yeah. in-joke that just went... I, it was if weird. It, if it was, it went over my head, too. <laughs> it was... You know, the, I, I will say this, though. It didn't bother me or take me out nearly as much as the Lost in Space joke. That, yeah. to me, was just really weird. I... I <laughs> Because it's one thing to have like a slightly sarcastic computer. It's another thing to have a character saying, I'm lost in time and I'm lost in, and then get cut off by another character who says, ah, uh-uh, don't say it, copyright. And I'm like, what? That's, that's that just seems really breaking to odd. the extreme. And yeah. what <laughs> didn't help for me is that it took me a moment to figure out what he was talking about. Because when I hear lost <laughs> in time and lost in space, I think Rocky Horror Show. So... I, I I was thinking, why are they referencing Rocky Horror at this point? It it was about five ten minutes later that the penny dropped. Oh, Bill Mooney. Okay, yeah, fine. Right. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, the, I mean, it was again. I, as I watched it, I uh, much like you, I, I had a smile on my face the whole time. I'm. I, I it felt very much kind of like a bit of a love letter to the show, yeah. to the fans. It touched on these big events that anyone who's familiar with the show would immediately kind of feel like, oh yeah, that's you know, that's this or that's that. Um, while also doing it in ways that hinted perhaps at things being a parallel universe and not the real mm-hmm. timeline. For instance, you mentioned Ivanova's uniform. The other thing I thought of is that Garibaldi and Sinclair are not in like the combat you know, yep. outfits that they yep. are in, in Babylon square that are wearing like the mm-hmm. helmets and, and chest protectors mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, there, you know, again, there, there, there was a lot to just really like about it. And the animation was beautiful. It, it, it gave me a lot of confidence that if they choose to pursue this route to continue the story, like you said, at the end, uh, it will be visually appealing, um, mm-hmm. that, that they can do it successfully. Um, yeah. And, and and I think that that's probably one of the best compliments I can pay it. I will pay it a few more. Uh, Bruce Boxleitner is amazing. Like, he yes. carries this thing the whole mm-hmm. way. And as someone who I've only experienced in live action, to have him just seemingly so effortlessly be able to step behind the mic, because yeah. it's different. As someone who's done it before, like, it mm-hmm. is a different kind of work. Like, the minute mm-hmm. that you are, are doing a voiceover for anything compared to when you're out there, you know, in, in front of a camera or in front of a live audience or something, like, it's so different. And he's just phenomenal. And it was absolutely, I was watching Sheridan throughout the course of the whole movie. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, and, I mean, it, testament to all of the actors, all, all of the voice actors in it, really. They're, they're all good, but, yeah, Box Lightner, since he's not traditionally a voice actor, that was very fortunate that he, he did so well. And yeah. uh, and the other the other actors they've got, in, including the replacement actors, um, for the, the ones that they, they couldn't bring back, all, all really solid. Uh, the 
the guy that I, and I'm, I apologize, I can't remember the, the the other actor's names, but the the actor that replaced Tim Choate as Satyrus uh, was was spot yeah. on, and Satyrus got a lot of the best yes. lines in it, and, and he made them most of them. Uh, so yeah, Paul Guyette is his name, and I just want to shout out real quick that not only did he do Zathras and Zathras and Zathras and Zathras, but he also did Jeffrey Sinclair, and I thought like you could not tell at yeah. all. You know, there was no, there was nothing betraying that like, oh yeah, there's a little hint. It was it, yeah, so it came as a surprise to me when I saw that. Um, mm-hmm. Phil Lamar, who did. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen Franklin uh, was just wonderful, and and I'm yeah. not surprised. I mean, he's he's amazing as John Stewart Green Lantern in Justice League, and he's done tons and tons of other voiceover work for video games and and, and films, etc. But just yeah, I, I I really enjoyed him quite a lot. He brought so much to the role, and the thing that I loved is that it felt like the character. Um, and I and and I feel like with some of the other guest actors, um, Paul Guyette aside, who we just mentioned. Unfortunately, we didn't get enough of Garibaldi to see what Anthony Hansen yeah. could do. You know, um, yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't have a problem with what Andrew Morgado did as Jakar, but he it wasn't Jakar. It was it was, no. it, it did not it was it felt like a, a different not necessarily a different character, but it was certainly a different presentation. Um, J- it, you know, J- yeah, Jakar felt very much to me like as often happens with reboots, a, I'm my own actor, I'm going to do my own thing, respecting the original script, whereas everyone else was trying to do impersonations of the actors. So he he stood out a lot for me as being, not, not failing at it, but just that took me out of the moment because he was the only one that seemed to be making that choice. Yeah. I will say that, I you know, Dylan, um Rebecca Reedy is the actor, um, there was something about her treatment of Sheridan, in particular at the beginning and then again at the end. It lacked, and I mean, Mira Furlan was incredible and uh, quite mm-hmm. frankly, I think deserved more recognition because her work was just amazing on Babylon 5. She did amazing work on Lost. Um, she would be very playful and tease mm-hmm. Sheridan at times. But never in a way that felt um, like it was belittling or that, like, you know, I'm smarter than you. She was like Delenn definitely was mm. that, but it never felt it never came off that way. It, there was a certain like grace and empathy about and, and playfulness about her. And I felt like that the beginning and again at the end that there was something of sort of like, oh, you stupid little human you know, it just, it, 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 that's how it landed for me. And I, and, and it did not feel like who Dylan mm. is as a character at all. I, I didn't pick up on that. Uh, I know we've been sitting here loudly agreeing with each other for the last half hour. Um, <laughs> I, 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 this, that's the one thing that I, yeah, I, I felt I was really pleased. Um, and maybe I was focusing on the script rather than the performance, but sure. I, I was really pleased that they, they did have that playfulness uh, in the performance rather than anything bigger and more serious. Uh, that that made me smile and that made me immediately feel like, okay, we're home. We're in the B5 universe. Um, that, that conversation about the socks, I just thought, yes. yeah, this is, this is great. I will take a, a very quick sidebar to mention, um, just in terms of you saying about uh, Mira Furlan and the, the, the recognition she deserved, I... I was fortunate enough to meet her a few years back. Um, mm. It was just just for a photo op, so it was only for a few seconds. But I I did I said to her, um, "Thank you. You you were the first woman to make uh, a teenage boy cry." Um, I, I I thank you for for opening me up to that emotion. She looked absolutely baffled. She's like, "Okay, I don't I don't really <laughs> know how to respond to that." <laughs> but I was like, "But it's true." <laughs> The amount of times yeah. I cried for Delenn um, <laughs> during those years, but yeah, I'm glad I got to yeah. say that to her. I yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's certainly well earned, and I agree. I mean, I certainly got very emotional during during mm. that show a number of times, and, and and mostly to to do with things that that she was doing. Uh, but you know, it, it it to me one of the things that I walked away from is is that like she sounded spot on right like the the, yeah. the 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 voice itself you know the the accent it, everything worked perfectly it just yeah there there, there felt to me like that there was just this, a, a little bit of um 
she didn't feel necessarily as kind and as warm as Delin, yeah. which is a weird okay. thing to say because that's something that Delin always had difficulty expressing, mm -hmm. especially during season one. It came, you know, it came more as the show yeah. grew. Um, but, uh, but again, I mean, she sounded great, and I agree with what you're saying too about the script, and 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 it definitely drew me in in that way. Um, but for some reason, there just felt something a little off about the teasing. Now, if the end, as you had mentioned earlier, is indeed a setup um, to explore a Babylon Five storyline down the road, here's my question for you, and this is all speculation at this point. We know that there is no Shadow War that mm -hmm. uh, IPX went out of business, so the Icarus never went to Zaha Doom. Uh, it's clear, however, from Delin's reaction to Sheridan when he's talking about the things that the other Sheridan mm -hmm. had said, that mm -hmm. clearly the Mimbari know the shadows. Now, Sinclair was also present, but it's interesting because Sinclair is a commander and he is not in charge of Babylon 5, but Sheridan is a captain and he is. So it's this. So so there's some big differences in this in this parallel universe that we're in, which leave a lot of questions, right? You know, it's like was Sheridan taken by the Mimbari? Is that what happened? You know, are we going to find out that it was? Uh, or excuse me, was Sinclair taken by the Mimbari? We're going to find out that it was Sheridan that that was taken by the Mimbari, or, or who knows? Because again, Sinclair was chosen to be in command of Babylon Five by the Mimbari. Like specifically, he had to be in charge because they knew what they knew about him. All of that said, do you think that if they pick up on this and they and they tell a story, are they going to tell a story devoid of the shadows? Or is it something that we're going to see, you know, kind of pop off just in a different way, perhaps? Yeah. And it, this this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that th this is potentially uh, a route for this fabled reboot of using characters that were created for a specific story. And that story is so intertwined yeah. with the shadows and and the shadow war. Uh, and then telling a completely different story with them, which I just, I think JMS would have to avoid the Shadow War uh, and the Shadows generally, because otherwise it it would breed far too much comparison. I, yeah. if, if he's going to do this at all, he needs to go off in a completely different direction. Um, now, now, you're right. There's there's so many ways, and particularly that, that hint that Delenn gave, there's so many ways that almost they could and should um, go that route. But I just, yeah, I I think it would be a mistake if if he really does insist on playing with the same characters as we remember them from the 90s, but telling a new story, it has to be such a different story. Otherwise, it's, it's going to seem like a pale imitation. Right. You know, and, and look, clearly he is capable of telling different stories. He's been doing that for, you know, the past 25 years or mm -hmm. not quite, I guess it was, what was it? 2000? No, I guess it was 99 when B5 went off the air. But anyway, yeah. um, you know, he's, 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 he, he's told, you know, multiple stories in different mediums and, 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 and it's still does it very, very well. You know, Sense8 is, is probably one of the more critically mm -hmm. acclaimed Netflix sci-fi series ever. Um, you know, his, his runs in, in certain comic books have, have been acclaimed or, or derided, depending on who's reading them. Um, <laughs> I happen to like what he did with Spider-Man. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, yeah, he's 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 a very talented writer, a very talented individual, and he's got an incredible pedigree, and you know was influenced uh, you know directly by some incredibly you know towering figures in science fiction and fantasy, including somebody like Harlan Ellison. Um, and so, it, it's hard to uh, imagine that he can't come up with something that will be satisfying mm -hmm. and interesting and, and, and I think mm -hmm. touch upon themes and issues that he loves to deal with, but does so in a new way. However, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there is that part of me that always wonders, well, does it have to be Babylon five then? And maybe yeah. it does, yes. right? Maybe, maybe, maybe the property is lucrative enough that that will be his vehicle to tell these new stories as opposed to him trying to get something off the ground, completely devoid mm -hmm. of that. Um, but yeah, it definitely left a lot of questions at the end because I was wondering, you know, mm. well, what, what did happen before all of this, you know, do, yeah. is Delin being coy about the shadows? The other thing, the one scene that we didn't mention, uh, is that there is, and, and one of the reasons I didn't mention is because it feels just such, it, it feels like such an outlier amongst the other scenes. And that's the scene between, um, Jakar, or not Jakar, excuse me, Londo, Ivanova and Sheridan mm -hmm. when the Vorlons throw the moon into earth. Yeah. It almost felt like it was just an excuse to blow the earth up. 
Yeah. I don't like, I didn't feel like I learned anything from it really. It was great to hear Peter Jurassic as Londo yeah. have something more to do than what we'd seen him have before. But yeah, it, 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 I still, I'm, I get why the other scenes were there for the most part. That's one mm. where I'm kind of scratching my head unless it was to show that the Vorlons, which I think anybody familiar with the show would be aware of this already were just as bad, if not worse than the shadows. They just had to be dealt with in a different way. And that made me think, well, what if it's not going to be the shadows in this new iteration mm -hmm. that are the real threat, but it will be the Vorlons. Yeah. Which is weird because we didn't see any Vorlons. Like we didn't see Kosh. We didn't see. So I don't, I don't know. What, what did you think? Yeah. When in that, that final scene uh, where we, we, we start off following Sheridan and, and Sheridan's talking and we can't see who he's talking to until it, we pan around and we see Delenn as a Mimbari. I thought he was going to be speaking to Kosh. Same um, here. That, that, that's what I was expecting. And then that's where my mind started ticking over the same kind of way you did, thinking, are the Vorlons around in, in this timeline? Um, if the Shadows aren't around, does that mean the right? Vorlons are just keeping to themselves? Because, well, we're, we're not going to do anything until we'll let them strike first. Um, or... Yeah, do are they going to rock up and just start doing their thing anyway? But then, is there any inherent drama in that? Because although yeah, the, the Vorlons are they turn out to be pretty mean. Effectively, what they're doing until the shadows start getting involved is playing God and just saying we're all important. So listen to us. We we are benevolent, and I, I don't know if there's any drama there. It's the it's the same kind of thing organized religion's been doing for centuries. It's, I mean, it, it is, yeah. To to be honest, they they the Volons represent until they go absolutely nuts. Um, the Volons represent your standard uh, Westernized Christianity, Judeo Christianity um, type religion. So yeah, I, I might argue even after they go nuts, they still do. But that's another story. Yeah, I I, I was trying not to go there, but as. <laughs> As an atheist, um, I, yeah, I, I may go there as well. But certainly, yeah, I, I don't know what would be the trigger if if they show up in this new timeline. What would be the trigger for them to start blowing things up? If there's been right. no shadow influence, what's the worst that can happen? Um, a planet says, we're not going to worship you. Is that enough for the Vorlons to start wiping wiping them out or... I don't know. You kind of need both because the whole the whole storyline of B five was these two great powers that we were stuck between. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it's, it's it's it would be a very odd story to tell without that. Um, you know, you think of the all of the storylines um, throughout the course of the series and the influence of the shadows you know, that, that hung over everything. And because mm. of that, of course, the influence of the Vorlons did as well. So mm. it would, yeah, I, 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 I'm much like I was for the road home. I'll, I'll be watching if, if, and when it does happen, whether that means it's the live action show or, or, or it's going to be continued in, in an animated form. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be there for it, but um, I certainly have a lot of questions and, and, and there's always that part of my brain and perhaps part of this is because I don't want to get my hopes up too high, but there's always that part of my brain that's sort of like, if it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I've got five seasons of this incredible show, a couple of really good TV movies, a couple of not so good TV movies, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a spinoff show that never got, you know, the chance to be what it could have been in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and you know, and uh, a spinoff DVD, which was shot in someone's garage, like you said, uh, and now this animated film, which yeah. again, you know, for as critical as as we can and have been of it, I'm just so glad that we have it, and I am so yes. glad that I watched it. And I, 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 I it, it's funny because sometimes I think that that's one of the things about this discourse that gets taken the wrong way, is that if if I'm critical of something or I say I might not like something as much it doesn't mean that I'm not glad that, that we have it, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm even glad for Spock's brain. Uh, so <laughs> I think that, I think that, uh, I, I think that, yeah. yeah, it's okay. It's okay to kind of be like, eh, I'm not so sure about this, but to still kind of enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how I felt, I think overall about the, about the movie. 
th this was the first of the Babylon 5 movies that I've gone back and rewatched within 24, 48 hours. Um, mm. Because it, it's a fun, easy watch. I, I, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a great film. If it turns out to be an epilogue for the series, that's, that's cool. I think it's a, it's a really nice way to wrap everything up. And as you said earlier, give a, a love letter to the fans. If yeah. it spins off something new, great. I'm just, yeah, I I don't know how that would work. But as right. you said, JMS is a very talented writer. If anyone can pull it off, he can. So I yeah, I try I try and remain optimistic. But Babylon Five is it's one of those things like the um, the Terminator films. <laughs> how many times have we heard? <laughs> Here's a new film that's going to spin off a trilogy. Well, that that, mm -hmm. that happened with Terminators 3, 4, 5, all of them. And the same thing with B5. We keep having pilot after pilot after pilot. None of them get anywhere. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not holding out much hope for this. Um, right. But if it happens, great. And if not, uh, it's, it's, another, it's another 80 minutes of Babylon 5 and a good 80 minutes of Babylon 5. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, in this day and age, the determining factor, of course, uh, about whether or not we see more, especially in this medium, will come down to the almighty dollar. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you are interested, uh, then I certainly recommend picking up your copy. Um, just a reminder for anybody that's curious, because somebody on threads asked me this question very seriously, and I'm just sort of like, why would you even think that? Uh, I am not paid for or supported by any corporations or studios at all. <laughs> so I can say that uh, having spent my own money on on Babylon 5, The Road Home, that uh, I would encourage people to pick it up uh, yeah. if you're a fan of the show. I, 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 genuinely, I mean this. If you are a fan of Babylon 5, I can literally see no reason at all for you to not have a copy of this and not watch it. Um, I think your enjoyment level will, will depend certainly on you know your engagement level with certain aspects of the show. Uh, but uh, overall, yeah, it just felt like kind of a love letter, and, and I think it's worth, it's worth having, and I think if it does well enough, we will get more, and... Um, I would be okay with that. I'll be okay if we don't, but I'll be okay. Yeah. Obviously I'd be glad if we got more to see, to see what JMS does have to say, um, mm -hmm. you know, with a, a, a new different story, perhaps. Yeah. Um, speaking of talented writers, uh, Matt, um, you of course, uh, mentioned earlier that not only will volume one be coming to, uh, pre-order here or to people that pre-order rather through the Kickstarter in a few weeks, um, most likely that it will also be on Lulu, but you also mentioned the Kickstarter for volume three. Um, what more can you tell us about volume three right now? Firstly, thank you for using talented writer as a segue. I thought you were going to talk about something else. <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> oh, volume three. I'm so excited. So hang on. I'm just going to, I need a, I need a prop. Yeah. Uh, oh, excellent. For those right, watching on so YouTube. We're about to get yes. something special here. So, no, this, you've seen this before. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so the original 2016 edition um, yeah. is kind of up to the halfway point, if you can see here, up, up to the black, the black Bar. That's the actual episode guide to the series. So yeah. if, if you're just listening to this, the first 400 pages is the episode guide to the series. <laughs> that's, that's what's been expanded into 800 pages for Volume 1. But then there's this other 400 pages that covered the novels, the comics, a complete chronology of the series, that that's canon that we were talking about earlier on that, that covers right, right. everything, um, guides to the merchandise, everything like that. So that 400 pages is also being expanded out. There's clearly, there's a load of updates because there's been... Uh, there's, there's been some new merchandise, there's new stuff to talk about. The timeline has expanded now with another 18 episodes, uh, and it will include the season two um, bits and pieces as well. And I've already been working on that. So since last September, every, every week I was going in and updating the timeline. So that's that's in a fit state already. Um, but there's loads of there's loads of extra stuff uh, that, uh, that I've been able to add in as well. So the, the novels and the comics... I was never happy with how I covered those uh, back in 2016. They were quite, mm. the entries were quite thin because I, I didn't do interviews. I was terrified of talking to people. Um, <laughs> and and the QL, QL podcast hadn't done that many interviews with uh, anyone. So they were basically just my write-ups. 
now I've gone down gone down the route of tracking down people to talk about them. So those are being massively expanded. Uh, I've got multiple new sections because I'm now not not strung up by a, a page count. There's an eight hundred page an eight hundred page limit uh, for for the page counts, and there, there was in two thousand and sixteen. So I had to be quite cautious about what I put mm -hmm. into the back half of the book. Now that back half of the book is expanded out to another 800 pages. I, I can, I can afford not to be so uh, strict with myself in terms of what goes in. Uh, sure. I've got some, um, so I've, I've got some really cool features that I'm working on. I've also, one of the things that I think is that I'm most looking forward to are, are bits that are not going to be written by me. So um, I've, I've <laughs> worked with, or I, I've, I've been speaking to people, including yourself, Sam, um, who've been a key part of fandom over the last 30 years to write essays about uh, their contribution, but from a, a, a personal point of view. So uh, two of the examples that, uh, that I've, I've got drafts of in already are uh, Brian Green has written me a wonderful piece about the yeah, history of yeah. the Owl's Place website, which is such an important piece of fandom. And he's given a... A history of it from a technical point of view here's what i did on the on, on what date and here's how the website grew but also it, it kind of his personal experiences and and what it meant to him and uh mj cogburn has done the same thing for me for the quantum leap virtual seasons which is you know this massive piece of fanfic that uh, generally i haven't got into fanfic but this is such an important part of ql history yeah, I, it, it deserved a place there, and and she's given me again just this wonderful personal piece that talks about the history, but but gives it this personal edge that if I was just doing it as a researcher and saying oh, these these stories were written on this date and published at this time, it it, it would be interesting, but it would be dry. Um, these these are personal stories that I'm putting in there, and I'm I'm so excited to be adding those in. So they're going to be in there, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of other stuff, and I'm. One of the things I'll be doing with the Kickstarter campaign is encouraging people as I'm writing to send me ideas. If there's anything that particularly they think, well, this 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 area has never been analysed. Matt, go off and do your thing. So I'm really looking forward <laughs> to doing that. Um, and the other thing I'm going to be doing during the Kickstarter campaign, I I found with the Kickstarter campaign for Volume One. Um, I've been doing periodic updates in kind of a blog format, which I've been really enjoying writing, and I think they've been quite well received. Uh, so yeah. what I want to do is actually formalize that and say as, as part of the Kickstarter campaign, I will be putting out a weekly blog available to backers about the writing process, which oh. I, I, sort of, I sort of did unofficially a bit. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I think... I think I could actually make something of that um, Absolutely. For, for the backers for the backers to read. And there's a, a Babylon Five book that I backed three, four years back. It's way overdue now. Um, <laughs> which, which volume three won't be, I'll add. But um, it, it's way overdue. But the writer of it has been putting out a weekly blog update, and uh, uh, reading about him researching has been so interesting. Mm. And uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be doing that as well. So that's that kind of comes outside what's going to be in Volume Three. But I think yeah, Volume Three is going to stand stand alone as being just this wonderful kooky mixture of everything that can't fit into a, a standard episode guide. So, and I, I don't know some of the stuff that's going to be in there yet, and that's part of the exciting thing that I know there's going to be uh, stuff yeah. that comes up while while we're working on it. So. That's going to go live soon. Now, with, with Volume 1, when the Kickstarter went live, I expected it to be out in a couple of months, and then various things happened, and it's ended up taking a year. Uh, it's all the better for it, um, but it's it, the, the process changed completely. For Volume 3, I'm going to be up front. It's going to be a year. It's uh, But yeah. because of that, you'll be able to follow the writing process through. One of the other things, actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention this here now. I've not spoken to anyone else about this. Um, Ooh, exclusive! The, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Uh, and this is what this is the other reason why I want I want to get the, the Kickstarter campaign done uh, sufficiently early. The uh, there's a, a very talented artist who did um, a, a three page uh, strip 
uh, with an alternate ending to Mirror Image, which mm. was inspired by Fate's Wide Wheel. And <laughs> he, he was kind enough to let me include that in Volume 1. Yeah, I've also spoken to him about a commission for Volume 3. Now, that oh. commission's going to end up being a stretch goal, so it depends on how many people I, I get backing this. It depends on how much money I can afford to, to yeah. actually work on that commission with him. Um, but he's going to work on adapting some of the comic strips that never were. So oh. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of stuff that never was. I, I love yes. reading about things that, that almost happened but didn't. And when the, when the innovation uh, comic book range folded, Acclaim got the rights to Quantum Leap. Uh, along with all the other universal properties, and there was there were attempts at a, a, a quantum leap sliders crossover. There was attempts. There was a, a, a quantum leap uh, where he, he leaps back to um, before so he, he leaps into uh, I think Gushy in nineteen ninety five or whatever. There's there's a number of really interesting sounding um, strips that never happened. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the original scripts for these, so these will be quite speculative. But I have spoken sure. to him and said, "Look, um, him and a, a writer friend of his have said, yeah, we're happy just to take those ideas and put together one or two or five or ten, depending on you know what how much backing we can get, pages just showing what might have been, um, and that's that's going to premiere in volume three. Oh, that sounds so, so cool. I agree with you. I love I love that sort of stuff. You know the things that never were, and yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I I would love to see that without a doubt. Um, I in some ways, if I'm being completely honest, I am more excited for Volume Three than I was for Volume One and yeah. Two. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that you know when it comes to the work that I've done on on the podcast, and 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 obviously you know listening to your podcast and listening. And having these chats with you and reading your books and, and of course, I mean, going all the way back and reading like the Quantum Leap book and, you know, the A to Z and, you know, whatever else, the making of Quantum Leap, um, you know, whatever I could get my hands on back in the day. Um, I am always, I always find new information that mm -hmm. you have found or unearthed. Like you're always, you're always giving me something new. Don't get me wrong. However, I have a, I have a decent handle on that. Like there's a part of me that says if I never learn another thing about the first, you know, five seasons of Quantum Leap, I'll be OK. I want to know more. But if mm -hmm. I don't, it's not that big of a deal. When it comes to all the other ephemera, though, there's so much that I don't know about the behind the scenes. Yeah. And there's so much that I've learned just within the past like year or two about like the the novels and, 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 and how those those books were created and some of the processes involved with that and, you know, the stance of of Don Belisario on them. You know, there's so much stuff that mm -hmm. I didn't know that I, I, I feel like I've only begun to scratch the surface on. So I can't wait yeah. to learn more about that when it comes to the comics, you know, your interviews with the, with the artists and stuff have, have been so, I've just been wonderful to hear because I feel like I'm learning things that not only did I not know before, but I never thought I would get the chance to know, mm -hmm. you know, to learn about. Um, and, and so to me, that's kind of what volume three represents. I think is, is it's not stuff that I, um, it's not stuff that's necessarily on my radar and to get the opportunity to learn about those things connected to this show that we love so much uh, is just so cool. And it's so valuable um, to, uh, you know, being kind of the, the keepers of that uh, 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 stuff, you know, to, to, to being able and, and all fans are, I'm a, when I say that I'm not talking about like you and I personally or anything, I'm talking about the fandom, you know, we mm -hmm. are in, in a lot of ways, we're the keepers of the flame more than, just yep. about anyone this side of Deborah Pratt, perhaps. And so I, I, as a fandom, that's, that's, that's what I mean specifically to be able to have that knowledge at our fingertips um, is incredible. So uh, I'm excited. And I, and I certainly, as I say, and have said before, I thank you for your work on that because um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's certainly a no stone left unturned mentality with which you approach this. And for, you know, for someone like me, I love that and appreciate it so much. Oh, thank you. I, I think the, the we, we kind of touched on it, but I think the, the, the thing about volume three that makes it feel like it, in some ways it's going to be the most important volume is Quantum Leap is one of these shows that it has so much variety from one episode to the next. You know, no matter what kind of mood you're in, you can pull an episode off the shelf and it will, <laughs> it will fit your mood. When you talk about an episode yes. guide, I'm very proud of what I've done with volume one, but it's 96 identical chapters. This sure. is going to be 
a mess. It's going to be an absolute variety. And it's going to mean that you can say, you know what? I, I, I want to learn about merchandise today. Flick through chapter on merchandise. And that will be a very different feeling chapter to the next chapter, which will be all about uh, back at the project and all the people that work at the project and, and the, the technical specs of Project HQ, which will be then very different to the next chapter, which will be what was Sam's experiences on Fate's Wide Wheel. You know, it's it, it's just going to be this <laughs> whole, like, really, I hope. Um, <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's going to be uh, no pressure. Um, just just this mishmash <laughs> that I think is really representative of what makes Quantum Leap beautiful. So, yeah, I, that, it's the one I'm most excited to be writing. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I also thank you for inviting me to contribute to it. And uh, my hope is, is that you will have a, a, a first draft of something by next weekend. Um, um, because it, I have been, I, have, I actually have been working on it. Finally, um, I didn't. Feel <laughs> there. <laughs> it's been a lot going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I that that sounds so cool to me. And uh, I, I think that it it's one of the things that I, I, we love about genre television and science fiction television in particular is that it does offer you that opportunity to kind of go somewhere new and different, you know, week in and week out. And I, I certainly, you know, I feel the same way, obviously about quantum leap that I feel about star Trek is, you know, I can, depending on the mood I'm in, there's plenty of mm -hmm. choices to be made. Um, and, and you, with, with fate's wide wheel, you know, one of the things that certainly kind of looking towards the future. Obviously we'll be talking about quantum leap as long as we possibly can, but also want to start talking about other things. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions and you can give some brief answers before we wrap up here uh, or not. If you want to give longer answers, that's fine too. Uh, but I'm inspired by a couple of things that we've spoken about. So thing one, your shirt. I love your shirt. What Thank is, you. what's your, what's your favorite uh, episode of bluey? <laughs> uh, it it has to be unicorns. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> he's so marvelously annoying oh, and quotable. Yes. Um, yes. Although actually, I, I'm not sure if I like the first unicorns episode or the, or the second one where he comes back and falls in love with the mother. That's, yes, that's that's oh. that goes very meta at the end. It, uh, right. It's yeah. So how about you? What's your favorite Bluey? I so I had the sentimental uh, uh, person that I am. Uh, I have to go with sleepy time. I, there's something about sleepy time. I, I as just, soon as as soon as you started speaking, I thought I bet you're going to say that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It makes me it's cry. It's so beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. same here. And I I, I said this uh, right after I watched it. I remember I posted something I, 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 on Facebook. I believe it was maybe. Um, uh, I feel like it is to me. And I, this is not hyperbole. That is when you see animated shorts that win an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. That's sleepy time. Like it is that yeah. good with how imaginative yeah. it is, the story that it tells, the way you know everything about it. It's just lovely. Um, I mean, do I you, love I love them all, and I've seen all of them many times. <laughs> do you, Do you have the soundtrack? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have the so. We 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 have the the we own the first one. The second one I just have uh, on the streaming service that I use. I mm -hmm. use I use Title for streaming, and so they have they have them both on there. Luckily, yeah, I, I remember distinctly when the uh, the first one came out. Uh, I, I went straight onto Facebook and said that the version of uh, the Creek with the lyrics has no oh. position being a, a track in a kids animated show. It it feels like it's too good mm. for that, but then. That's the level right. of Bluey all the way through. It all feels like it's too good to be where it's at. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No. Oh, there's another one that I love. Um, oh the, Chinese gosh, I the Chinese I, restaurant oh, one. The Chinese restaurant one. That's, ah, that's ah, the, the, the perfect oh, visualization of parenthood in five yes. minutes. It's like, yep. I completely agree. And it, you yeah. know what? I'm not going to lie. It has been, that has been a parenting tool. You know, because there have been plenty of times when I've just been sitting there kind of like maybe in my own headspace, maybe just sort of like, oh, no, kids, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do that or whatever. And then the, then I think about the Chinese restaurant and I'm just sort of like, oh, just splash in the water with them, you know, like yeah. get, get in, you know, get in there with them. And, it, and it's yeah. always better for it. Uh, yeah. Everything is. Um there's a, a newer one, at least newer to us. I don't necessarily know exactly how they're released for you. Um, but here we have... Um, the the entirety of the first two seasons, but only like 
30 some episodes of the third season, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, so it's, it's towards the end of what we have released this, this far. I and it, I, I, I want to say it's to astronaut. Well. Okay. Um, but it's not astronaut. I can't remember the title of it now, but basically maybe it's space fairs. Ah, I, I'm blanking on the title, but it's, uh, it doesn't act. Bluey's not actually in it. Um, it's, uh, Mackenzie and rusty and, and one of the other schoolmates. And, um, um, they, they're, they're pretending that they're in a rocket ship, uh, and they have to make like uh, extra vehicular activities. And one of them keeps getting lost on purpose. And it's just beautiful and heartbreaking and wonderful. And, uh, oh, and the ending I is just magical. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I remember, yeah. After that dropped, um, everyone on Facebook just arguing over exactly what it meant as well. I mean, it's, it had people yeah. like debating the meaning of the episode. Yeah. So yeah. good. It's one of those rare instances where actually my wife had seen it before I did, because uh, usually mm-hmm. I'm the one that's you know watching it with the kids, and she watched a, a few of them one day with Hattie, and uh, uh, I actually think I walked in right after it had ended, and she was kind of crying, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Everything okay?" And she was just like, "Yeah, it's just this episode of Bluey it really got to me." And I was like, "Oh boy!" And then I watched yeah. it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I get it." Um, yeah. but, uh, all right. So, uh, one last one, speaking of space and we've, we've talked about Babylon five, we've talked about, uh, you know, our, our beloved quantum leap as well. But, uh, my other, my other favorite show, um, that I'm actually starting to assemble some things for, um, magazines, books, etc. Cause I want to do a special series of episodes for fates wide wheel on it is of course, Star Trek deep space nine. So Mm -hmm. my question to you about Star Trek Deep Space Nine is who is your favorite character and why? Um, Oh, now you see, I'm not as big of a Deep Space Nine (laughs) fan as you. Um, I I like it. Okay. Okay. um... You have, you've seen it all the way through though, correct? Oh oh, yeah. Yeah. So several times. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I I just say I'm, I'm not as connected to it enough to know that I got it particularly feel for any, any particular character. I, I, I always had a soft spot for Nog, um, not Mm -hmm. Nog, Rom, uh, always had a soft spot for Rom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. You answer that question and I'll have a think. Who's your favorite character? So it's very, it's difficult for me. I love them all. Obviously it would be easy for me to say Cisco. It'd be easy for me to say Garak. It'd be easy for me to say O'Brien, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I do, I really love them all, but if I, if I'm pressed, uh, I, I go with Odo and I, yeah. I think it's because Odo was the first character in the show that for whatever reason, I just really connected with. I loved mm-hmm. his story arc. I loved his storylines. I thought Renee version was just incredible in the role and ended up doing so much, you know, that, that, he started off, obviously, you know, as kind of just this sort of the heavy in a way, almost, especially the straight man to, you know, the quirk, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and then the character just grew in so many ways. And the romance uh, aspect with Kira, the, you know, the struggle with where his home really was. And, mm-hmm. and I, I just always loved that character and connected with that character. And so, um, yeah, for me, it was, uh, I, again, if pressed, I have to say Odo, but uh, I do, I do love them all. <laughs> Yeah, I, Odo was one that really surprised me because, uh, and I, I guess this is the same kind of thing that we we got with Babylon Five, particularly with the, the lights of Jakar. Um, I I went in there thinking Odo was quite a, no pun intended, but a two dimensional character. Um, yes, and and he was for a, a little while at first, and then they I think sort of early season two, um, Necessary Evil is it? Um, yep. They they start yep. they start to give him a bit more depth and. Yeah, by by the end of the series, they've done so much with him that I never saw coming. Uh, so yeah, yeah, certainly in terms of character growth, um, I I almost said Odo. Um, yeah, yeah, I might have to agree with you on that. Excellent. I'm glad but we could agree I, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it, it's it, it's a it's a really interesting family of characters, um, and. Even when they they throw Worf into the mix, when they have to switch mm. out the Daxes, um, it, it still they seem to just settle again very quickly. And yeah. yes, Garrick, you mentioned Garrick, of course. Garrick's fantastic. And yeah. Garrick again is one starts off as such comic relief, and then there's there's some really there's some really good stuff that Andrew Robinson does 
later yes. on. And I saw I saw a meme the other day, which I I knew, but it also seeing it like in black and white really brings it home. Where someone says, you know, you know, it's a good character when he's in forty odd episodes out of a hundred and eighty, and he makes that much of an impression that you think he's a regular character. And it's great. Right. Garrick is uh, I. I kind of always feel like he's in more, even though in, in my head I know that he's not. Yep, I completely agree. Completely mm. agree. Uh, he, he, yeah, he. Huh. Uh, the the work that he does is pretty incredible. And again, I think that that's just one of the the the, the hallmarks of the show in general is the levels that are given to all of the characters. I mean, especially when you look at like Cisco's journey or Kira's journey or Odo or Garrick or Bashir O'Brien. You know, they all have these incredible journeys, and we see these multi dimensional characters who don't mm. always do the right thing or make the best mm-hmm. choice. And the show and the characters are richer for that. Um, so I, I will always stand by my love of, of, of ds9 um and uh i i think that you you know you mentioned uh the the switchovers of the daxes in particular and i it's funny because watching the show as it aired i remember just being really sad because you know i'd grown to love jedzia and and mm-hmm. and, and i just really was like ah yeah. you know don't don't take her away from me and i know that the uproar at the time you know there was just no acceptance for esri at all yeah. and and some people just really fell off re-watching the show um since you know the, the few times that i've rewatched the entirety of the show i the show does not suffer for it at all no and neither does the character or the actors around her like it's no. it's fantastic and i think it's another it's one of those other signs that it's kind of like if we can get out of our own way when it comes to our approach to these things that you know that we enjoy or we could possibly enjoy we'll enjoy them so much more yeah. you know because the work is the, the work that's being done it's it's good it's just that you know we might be kind of in our own heads about it and mm. and and i think that that obstacle to being able yeah. to enjoy the entertainment or the art around us uh, is unfortunate but it's completely natural and understandable yeah we we fall in love with things in a certain way and then if we're told this thing has changed well yes but I loved it the way it was. So I, I, I don't even want to consider <laughs> loving this, this new thing that it's become. Um, but as, as someone who has a kindergartner now, I, I, I really understand that vibe over the past couple yeah. of weeks because yeah. it's, and, and not just on her part, but on my part too. It's like, no, I love things the way they were. Um, yeah. Matt Dale, it is always such a pleasure. I cannot thank you enough for joining me here today. Uh, tell people where they can find you, find out more about your work, um, and stay updated so they don't miss the Kickstarter for Volume 3 of Beyond the Mirror Image. Uh, Sam, firstly, thank you for inviting me on, because it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it's, it's always so much fun. And uh, I, I was sorry. I'm, I will answer your question in a minute. But I was talking to my partner earlier on, <laughs> and she was, she was. We, we were talking about the fact that I'm podcasting tonight. And so you know, actually, I, I'm not podcasting tonight. I'm chatting to a friend tonight who I've missed talking to and haven't been able to speak to for a while. And we happen to be recording it for other people to hopefully enjoy. I don't know, whatever. Um, to answer your question, you're gonna directly, make me cry more than an episode of Bluey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true though. Um, oh, it's very sweet. If, Thank you so much. If if she hadn't gone to sleep, I'd drag her in here to confirm, but that's exactly what I said. <laughs> uh, it's um, best best place to find me is forevertv.co.uk. Um, I'm on I'm on X. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Lulu, obviously, and QuantumLeapPodcast.com. But all of those are linked to from forevertv.co.uk. So that's that's the best kind of hub to find me. That's where you can buy uh, find links to the books as well. And there will be links to the, the new Kickstarter campaign and any future Kickstarter campaigns that uh, are launching, including the, the one that's coming after Volume 3, which is nothing to do with Quantum Leap. Nice. So. Oh, that's exciting. Well, um, I certainly hope that folks, I'm sure if they're listening to this, they probably already have. But just in case you haven't, make sure you go over to forevertv.co.uk uh, to to find everything about Matt and his projects. Um Someone recently suggested to me, as I was kind of cycling through potential topics to discuss on the podcast, uh, Red Dwarf. And surprisingly enough, that is one of my blind spots. Um, I'm assuming you have a level of familiarity with Red Dwarf that far surpasses mine own. I, I've been a huge fan of Red Dwarf since uh, Series 3, when I, I that was the first one that I, I watched as it went out, and then... Um, picked up the first two seasons on video as they came out a couple of years later so yes I, it's it's been in my blood since i was 10 
Excellent. Uh, will Will you come back on the show after I've seen some of it and talk about it with me? Yes. Yes. Let's talk Red Dwarf. I'd love to. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Awesome. It's a date. Uh, Matt, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Take care of yourself. And uh, you. I look forward to, to having you on again soon. Great stuff. I look forward to it. Take care, Sam. <laughs>